We know that Black history is American history, too often limited to tales of blood and struggle and less portrayed in stories of joy and unsurpassed achievement. Colorado is particularly rich in this history, as evidenced by the many figures living in our state who embody the challenges and triumphs unique to Black people. High school student Joshua Ray had the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to sit down with both Hughes Van Ellis, one of the last known survivors of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, and Ed Dwight, the first Black astronaut candidate and acclaimed sculptor. The three met at Ed Dwight's Denver-based art studio, where Joshua spoke with Mr. Dwight and Mr. Ellis. He spoke to them about their lives and achievements. Not surprisingly, Joshua sought their words of advice for young people like himself. My name is Joshua Ray, and it is a pleasure meeting you and talking about all the things that you accomplished. Okay. Um, like I said, thank you, Mr. Hugh Van Ellis, also affectionately known as Uncle Red, for this opportunity. It is an honor to have this opportunity to interview you and learn more about your legacy. I understand that you have a nickname, Uncle Red, and I wanted to know why this nickname was given to you. Uh, they tell me I was, when I was a small kid, they said my, I had uh, red hair, so my dad named me Red. So most of my brothers didn't even know my name the way up <laughs> They always called me Red. <laughs> what are some things that you're passionate about? I'm passionate about a good life. I, I like a good family, go out and sit down and talk. And I like to be around a family who would sit down and discuss different ideas about life. I like, I like to be around people, all people. I like all people. I don't hate nobody. Um, Mr. Ellis, can you please share a little bit about your birthplace and upbringing? I was born in Holdenville, Oklahoma, 1921. January 11, 1921. And after that, we moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma. We were told I was only five months old. That's when the drought broke out. So we, we were sharecroppers that time. We had came from Holdenville. And we got, the only way we got out of town is on a horse and a wagon bus. We didn't have an automobile like a lot of other people did. We were sharecroppers. We'd go from town to town, and uh, city to city, and, and uh, work on farms, like planting cotton, picking cotton, stuff like that, hay. So that's what my dad did, we did. After that row, we got out of, we moved to a place called Clamo, Oklahoma. And we grew up, I grew up all over the state of Oklahoma, sometimes we moved to Kansas, sometimes we moved back to Oklahoma, just, just different places. There was a dark and tragic day in history of Tulsa known as the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. Can you tell us how old you were and what you remember about the horrific day? I was only six or five or six months old. My sister Val was about six years old. Later in the years, uh, she tried to tell me a little about it and told me that uh, during that time, they, uh, they heard shooting and going on and going on as far as stuff, and, and they told us how to get out of town. They were saying with burning and shooting and killing, dragging people in the streets. Uh, they said uh, they'd go in the house, set the curtains far. Back in there wasn't no water. We didn't have any running water, so you had to get out of that house. See, we, we just barely got out of there. Just, it, was, it was late night, and we got out of there, just went out sleeping clothes. We didn't have time to put our clothes on. We just lucky to get out, you know, late at night. What was it like growing up in Tulsa during its time of prosperity? Well, growing up in Tulsa, me, me being a a few years after that, I used to go to Tulsa State with my sister Viola in the 30s. And that, that was, and when I went back then, 
the black Wall Street was doing pretty good, not as well as it was when it first started. So they had their own steel home, they had their own hospitals, they had their own nurses, they had their own cab service. Uh, back in then, they had their own table shops. The women had their hat shops. You could walk in and have a hat made, you know, or walk in the later and they'd you up for a dress. It wasn't as done as well as it did, they tell me when, before the massacre, you know, but they did build some back. What does the term Black Wall Street mean to you? It means a whole lot to me, this state, uh, you, you, you come and build something, then you get it destroyed. And it takes the uh, opportunity away from the people, you know, like, probably that wouldn't happen now that I had about a, a better opportunity in life, you know. Right now, I don't think we, you know, a lot of people don't trust. You build something, you might think you're going to get destroyed, so. So quite a few black people have a little business, but not like it was Black Wall Street. Can you explain the recent and significant court decisions regarding a lawsuit you and others have filed related to the Tulsa Race Massacre? Well, last time we were in court, uh, they want the case to continue. But the jury decided to uh, throw it out. But we, uh, it's been uh, six months. Let's see, I was in June. It's been during a year now. Uh, and she decided to continue the case. The uh, attorneys had enough evidence there to make her believe it. Just to be done. What should justice look like from the descendants of the massacre? Well, it, it's good. It, 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 uh, the descendants of, uh, you know, they benefit from that. And young people will benefit from it. They don't know what history is. I think it would be a better world if everybody knew about history. And a lot of them don't know about no history. A lot of them have never heard of, never heard of it about the Wall Street massacre. They never heard about it. And I think it would be education to young people, mostly. What is your message to the United States concerning the Tulsa Race Massacre? My message to the United States we have to, we want justice. We want something did about it. We want something did about it right now. We, we, I'll still, let us have justice for everybody, not only just black people, but people. And I would think that would help our country. When something is done wrong, correct it. That's what I think. What would you have to say to people that still are um, thinking that we should be separated in colors and cultures and things like that. I think that's wrong. We we all we all one we all one America. We supposed to be one America. That's what I think. I think it would be a better life. Uh, just let me be an America like everybody else. That that's the problem. We are, we all one people. People we are all supposed to be one America. We, both, we we built the United States for freedom, freedom of speech. We are all human beings. That's what I think. Uh, what would you like to say to people that are still affected about um, by these events? I would like to say this: you have to keep living. You have to. You're not going to forget it. But you just have to keep living and hope. Keep your hopes up. I think things gonna get better. I hope this clears up. I hope this. I hope this year clears it up. What is your message to younger generations concerning the Tulsa race massacre? Our message to them: I would like the, them to know about history. I, I was, I was, I was taken away from. Uh, they don't, they don't know anything about history. And my message, I hope it gets where in schools and books, 
and they look they'll, they'll learn more about history. We were taught not to say anything back in those days. Our parents tell us don't talk about it. We weren't allowed to talk about it. See, a couple of years ago, my sister she was mentioned to her, her grandson, my nephew Ike, and she mentioned about the row. And that's where this got started. They started working and digging up history and all what had happened, when it happened, what it happened, you know, back in there. So my thing is that I'd like to, for young people to know. A lot of young people don't know about it. Yeah. A lot of old people don't know about it. They never heard about it. So that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, let people know about what happened back in there. How does it make you feel that a lot of schools aren't talking about a lot of African American history? Uh, when I was coming, like I said, you know, uh, old people say, don't talk about it. Let the, let the young people know. See, young people got the people that lead the world, so let them know what's happening. And I'm glad that. I understand there's some books out on it. I've been, I've had a, you know, a lot of interviews, so it's it's not a getting around. Some of them pretend they don't know, but they know. They don't want to talk about it. It's just out there. It's out there. So that's a good thing. So I call this year a good year. What would you say to a young person like me who's about to set foot on their own path? Be strong. Believe in yourself. If you don't, if you haven't got an education, get you go to school. Get an education. Good education. That's gonna help you through life. That's that's, that's my suggestion. Ed Dwight's artistic portfolio is nothing short of prolific. Amazingly so. His body of work includes memorials and sculptures across the country depicting the Underground Railroad, the historical roots of jazz, Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, President Barack Obama, to name but a few. Mr. Dwight is credited with committing history to physical memory in places like Austin, Texas, with a 40-foot-long, 26-foot-tall memorial to African-American history. And of course, his 27-foot-tall cylindrical Tower of Reconciliation, located in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, I'm, I'm Joshua Ray, and it is an honor to sit down here and interview you. Well, Joshua, I'm, I'm Ed Dwight, and uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sculptor. Uh, I've done a lot of other things in my life uh, besides sculpting, uh, but uh, that thing on the gravestone, I wanted to, to, uh, to read sculpture uh, par excellence and stuff. I think you, you did a lot of great things to bring young African Americans like myself to to reach and go to different levels and you inspire many people. So I just want to thank you for that. And my first question is, who has inspired you in your life to shape you as the person that you are now? Yeah. Well, you know, you, you, I have to start with the basics, you know. Uh, uh, my mom set an in interesting table for me because uh, I I started school when I was two years old, and uh, she had me in every art class, and uh, got me a library card at four, and uh, got me on as an altar boy when I was five, and got me in the Cub Scouts when I was six, and Boy Scouts when I was seven, and it just went on with her kind of guiding. Uh, uh. My mom had a college degree, so she kind of knew which, what, what, where she was coming from. And uh, of course, since I was a little kid, uh, she took care to, 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 to show me what the world was all about, you know, and, and what kind of things that grew that made food and, and gave me lessons on the Milky Way and orbital mechanics that I ended up finding out. I didn't know what orbital mechanics was until I got in the space program. And my mother was teaching me all this stuff when I was three or four years old. <laughs> And, and then my dad, in, in a, a kind of a, a different uh, approach, he was not a, a very uh, talk talkative. He was kind of, uh, he, was, he went to the 10th grade school and dropped out of school. 
But what was magic about watching my dad and, and the co contrast between him and how educated my mom was, but my dad had something to offset that, and he left school at the age of 16 to play professional baseball. So he played in the Negro Baseball League and was a star in the Negro Baseball League, you know, uh, with the 10th grade education. But at the end of the day, things come together in strange ways. The owner of the Kansas City Monarchs baseball team, his, fa his brother was a PhD chemist. So when my dad left baseball, he got my dad a job working in, in his chemical lab. And 20 years later, my dad was the chief chemist of the state grain department for the state of Kansas. So now you say, what in the world, how could that happen? I mean, this guy with a 10th grade education. And he was a, he was a, a George Washington carver of, of chemistry. And the guy was brilliant as a chemist, but he was taught by the right people. And so, uh, so I have to give it uh, props to both my mom and dad, but I didn't have, ever have any trouble getting mentors because as a kid, I was always doing things. The guy by the name of Phil Borth that owned KC Photo. And I got a job working for him delivering film uh, for him at 15. And the reason I'm saying, because all these guys in, he asked a question about mentorship. And, and naturally, I'm going to school. It was a part-time job, naturally. Uh, uh, and I was so precocious to him. This guy taught me film, uh, ph uh, photography. And uh, next thing you know, I'm in charge of his developing room. When I turned uh, 17 or 18, this man, a 60-year-old man who had been in that business his whole life, offered me his business. And, so, and he says, yeah, I'll, I'll sell it to you for nothing uh, because I had been working for this guy for a couple of years, right? Uh, and I, I had known, uh, uh, these people outside didn't know that I was developing their film, that I was, he put me in charge of the film room and the whole thing and the large ring room and, and I knew photography. And I, was, and I was this kid and this man was gonna give me his business. I mean, what's up with that, you know? But I chose to join the Air Force instead, and this guy got mad at me. I mean, he said, how dare you? Uh, you know, you're, you're perfect for this job. Uh, uh, and so why wouldn't you take it? This is an opportunity. And so, but my mom put my coattail, and she said, son, if he gave you that business, do you think all the rest of those white businesses are going to continue to do business with this guy, with the, with the company? And the answer was no. But I had mentors coming out of the woodwork everywhere, and I, I came to the conclusion uh, uh, the more things uh, that you're really interested in and you do them well, whatever they are, uh, mentors come, fall, start falling out of the sky. You are many different things and a number of titles, including the first African-American astronaut candidate, an engineer, and a sculptor. What drives you to be motivated to accomplish all these things? Well, uh, mom, uh, get, mom to taught me that, you know, I mean, first of all, she t told me how wonderful America was and about uh, uh, people who, who need things. And that, that the best thing I could do was to start, when I got to be a real guy, uh, to start fulfilling needs, the needs of, of folks and stuff. And so, and I look back on everything I've done and it all dropped out as a need pattern. When I saw somebody that needed something, I was there. Because when I was in the Boy Scouts, they, they, so if, if you have a little old lady across the street, you get across the street too, uh, you know? And so and I, I, I adopted that attitude. And, and when I got in the military, I, I started changing things that I could change at my level. Uh, and, and, you know, and the black enlisted kids that came in, I mentored them and they helped them out and they died just saying, I want to go to work for Lieutenant Dwight because he, uh, you know, because he, under, he gets in and understands what we're doing and to help us, uh, you know, because I saw a pattern happening in the military and I'm, I was an officer, right? And, and I would sit and watch. You, you'd have black enlisted people that had been there 
for a time. And these white kids would come in, and the blacks would train them. And I say, you know, these white kids are getting promoted over the people that train them. But I just saw it was an inequity, and I just thought, uh, there's something wrong with that. And the same thing happened when we were trained, when I was a flight instructor. We were training pilots from all over the world. They gave me all the white guys from Norway and Denmark, and, you know, uh, uh, and, and they gave all the brown guys from Iraq, Iran, Turkey, uh, Japan, uh, and, and they gave them to the white guys, okay? And they were washing these brown guys out like you won't believe. And so I went to Captain Joseph, I said, Captain Joseph, I said, what's going on here? I saw all, the, all, the, all, the, all these white guys that are graduating, you know, all my, all my guys are white and all that kind of stuff, and the other guys had their white guys too. But all the brown guys are getting washed out, what's going on? And my, Captain Joseph said, it was none of your business. And, and, and so about a week later, and I, apparently he had done a little bit of research. He calls the man and he says, you know, uh, Lieutenant Dwight, you, you're right. I, I said, what's your solution? I said, well, give all the brown ones to me. And I started graduating these kids. And it didn't have a dang thing to do with their qualifications at all. It had to do with the language barrier. Because these white guys were saying, do this, and there does the language and flying away. And these guys didn't understand that because a lot of buzzwords in flying, you, you know, uh, uh, that, that a white kid would understand that they didn't understand. And I was graduating these kids like you won't believe, you know, and I got an award for that, you know. And so uh, you ask me why I do this stuff, and it has to be when I see something that's out of kilter, out of whack, uh, I got, first of all, I got to decide whether I can do anything about it or not, but when opportunities came that I could do something about it, well, hell, I, I, I didn't care anything about, how, about it being none of my business. I just thought there was something wrong with it. When did you realize that sculpting would be your career? Did this come easy for you? When, when I realized that uh, art was going to be my career, I was two, <laughs> I was two years old. <laughs> but uh, but I, I had this knack for making images from the beginning. And, that's, and I got a scholarship out of high school. I had the one, the first three ribbons in the Kansas art competition in the state of Kansas. And they had never been done before. And uh, so the nuns, I went to a private Catholic school. So the nuns took it to Kansas City, the Art Institute, took those paintings over there. And they gave me a scholarship to, uh, to go be the first black to go to the Kansas City, the Art Institute. So I was heading straight for the art world. Uh, and, uh, and my dad sat down and got a hold of me. And, and he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to so be an artist. He said, no, you're not. He said, I'm not going to take care of you the rest of your life, boy, you know. And so I said, what do you think I should be doing? She said, you're going to engineering school. And I, and I said, well, what do they do? He said, what do you mean, what do they do? In my brain, uh, we had a railroad track that went right past the farm every day. And I, I was, I, I, and I'd go out there and I'd wave at the, at the, it, the engineer <laughs> that was driving the train. <laughs> so my old man told me I was going to be an engineer. I said, Dad, I don't want to drive no train. And he said, what the hell's wrong with you, boy? <laughs> you crazy. But you know, I'm talking about an engineer. I said, well, what do they do? And he said, they make money. That's all you need to know. They have architectural engineering. Uh, and so, I can draw. So I went to, I went to college and I, uh, uh, I was going to be an architect or an engineer, you know, and that would satisfy him. And I could draw, I could still draw and design things and stuff like that, you know. And so, so anyway, that's where I was headed. Uh, I got an opportunity to, uh, to be a pilot, so I, I chose that. How do you feel about your life's pathway? Well, you know, when you're doing it, uh, you, you know, you don't think in those terms. You know, uh, to me, everything I've ever done is all connected to each other. I mean, there's nothing, because uh, people look at it and say, well, what are you talking about? You, you, you was over here doing, uh, doing astronaut stuff and military stuff, and over here you, you're building buildings uh, over here, and over here you got this big restaurant chain, you're selling people food, and, you know, and over here you got this thing going, and over here you got that thing going. And to me, that, that was all connected to, to me, it was all connected together. Uh, uh, and there were opportunities. Every single one of those things was a classic opportunity to do something.
bigger and better they kind of than I they had done before but it had to do with helping folks it was all every one of those things I did was helping to fulfill a need because when I got into the construction business uh, the, the, the need was black housing in Denver, Colorado. There was no black housing hardly. Uh, you know, we didn't have kind of big, big time ghettos with uh, hundreds and hundreds of apartments like, like, uh, like Chicago and some of these other places. We didn't have that. And it was 60,000 blacks in the state of Colorado. And you go back east, there's 60,000 blacks in four or five blocks, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and so, so we didn't have that impact of stuff, but uh, but the, the, the stuff did come up about where does black housing ex exist? Is there black housing? Is there a need for black housing uh, in Denver? Uh, you know, because, because when I when, when I first came to Colorado, blacks could not live east of York, York Street, okay, which is not far from here. Uh, after I got out of the military, I came to Denver. And I was the first black to move live on Montville Boulevard, across the from the, from the museum. In my restaurant chain, I, 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 I'm from Kansas City, and they have good barbecue in Kansas City. So obviously, I wanted some barbecue at Kansas City Barbecue in Denver. And so I built my own barbecue rib chain, and I designed my own barbecue sauce and hooked up with the Department of Agriculture for all my recipes I designed. It took me a year, so I had five restaurants, one in Fort Collins, and, and one downtown, and one in Inglewood, one on West Coast, West Colfax, and, and one on Colorado Boulevard. So anyway, I got, had all these restaurants, but I want, I did it, so we could have some good barbecue in Denver, you know. <laughs> and so as a result of that, to answer your question, all of these things all kind of fit together in a larger plan to to to, to, to bring equity, if you will, to things that that were that were needed. But, 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 but those are the challenges, and it was the whole thing, it was a bunch of fun when, when, when you start to think about it, you know? So I've done all of these things, but it was fulfilling a need. What is or has been important to you? What's, what's kind of important to me, like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of losing my eyesight now, and the thing I, worry, I don't worry about, I, I'm not worried about the money. If, if I stop doing what I'm doing right now, I, 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 I don't worry about the money. I, 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 I kind of worry a little bit about missing what I'm doing because I love what I do, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but the thing that's, that's, that's critical to me is my clients. All the rest of the stuff can go. If I never made another dime in my life, uh, I, I want these clients to be happy and, and I want them to, to uh, finish their, their dream because they come to me to manifest their dream. Uh, you know, and I got a group of people uh, uh, that I make commitments to and, and, uh, and that's one of the things important to me right now is making them happy, <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> what would you say to a young person like me who's about to set foot on their own path? Well, uh, you know, the world is wider, especially today. Uh, the world is wide open for you to do anything you want, any dream you could possibly have. Uh, and, and, and it's all about preparing for it and getting ready for it. And if you're really interested in something, uh, th there's Google there. I mean, there are things where you can do research you can't believe, okay? Uh, there's Wikipedia. All this stuff that Wikipedia gives you came from books. And if you go down to the bibliography, there's all those books that they got it from. So that's where I went, uh, uh, you know, for the information that I needed. And I went and got those books wherever they were, through Amazon or whatever, to sit down and figure out, you know, where was I going to be prepared for what this dream, if I had a dream, first of all, you got to get a dream. That's the first order of business, okay? What are you interested in? And you really got to be interested in it. Whatever it is, uh, it doesn't make any difference, uh, you know. But be the best, whatever it is that you can be, because in every one, everything that we talked about just now, had to do with a people coming to me and offering me stuff. Hardly any of that stuff, except for the barbecue rib thing, uh, you know came from Ed Dwight, but the rest of the stuff, people came to me and said, I think you can do this. 
Well, I'm offering you an opportunity to do this. Whether it was flying, whether the astronaut, the whole astronaut thing was all about that. It was about my body of work. What was I doing? How good was I doing it? What was I, do was, it was I at the top of my game? And so when the president was looking for a black astronaut, uh, I mean, they had to go find one. Where do you, where do you find a black astronaut? So you, you go find somebody that's been doing something really, really well uh, and getting rewarded for it. And that's how they, out of all the pi black pilots in the, United, in the world at that time, why are they white? What was it about me? And it was my body of work. Because I, I had done it very, very well. And I was getting an award every other month, either, either just finishing another college thing or, or fixing something within the, in the, in the operational unit that I was in. Uh, and, and I had the greatest jobs in, in, in the world, and I did them all well. But I, I worked my fanny off to get ready for them, whether I was doing the intelligence briefing to the general staff. And you know, I'm just, I, I was on the San Francisco Air Traffic Control Board. I was the youngest member of the Air, Air Traffic Control Board. And I'm on a board as a captain uh, uh, in my 20s with seven company presidents of seven airlines. What's that all about, you know? And what that was all about that, what was that? I volunteered to go to air traffic control school in Oklahoma City when the opportunity came up to do that, uh, you know? And, uh, and I had done all that stuff and did it well. So when the president came to look for a black astronaut, my name fell out. You know, here's a guy that can, man, this guy is, he's doing everything seemingly very, very well. Uh, and the requirement was, uh, the last three effectiveness reports that you had that the officers get every year, the last three had to be rated outstanding for me to become an astronaut, okay? Well, my last four were rated outstanding. Uh, and so it's that kind of stuff I'm, I'm saying. That. But whatever the dream is, you gotta stay with it, find a mentor, and, and, and listen to what he says. And it was great uh, to have you here in my studio and, and being interested in doing this stuff uh, and interviewing me. And so this is absolutely phenomenal. And, and I hope you walk away with something from, from here. I mean, I really uh, hope that, uh, that uh, uh, talking to me and being in this environment with all these people who are trying to do great things is just, just to listen to, to what they're saying. And if you got it, uh, in, 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 in anything that you need answers to after this whole thing is over, give me a holler and, and just give me a ring to say, hey, Mr. Dwight, what would you do in a case like this? <laughs> All right, well, thanks a lot again. Okay. To learn more about Mr. Ellis's story, which is still unfolding today, please visit justiceforgreenwood.org. And to learn more about Mr. Dwight's continuing artistic inspirations and to view his incredible sculptural masterpieces, please visit edwhite.com. To continue the growth and development of educational and community resources centering Black folks, we invite you to both support and plan to visit History Colorado's Black History and Cultural Heritage Department, the Blair Caldwell African American Research Library, the Black American West Museum and Heritage Center, and the Center for African and African American Studies on the CU Boulder campus.